At 720 2nd Street in Oakland sits a facility with an estimated value of $53.7 million, 9,273% higher than the $573,270 average for industrial properties in its 94607 zip code. This facility is Digital Realty, a company engaged in the acts of data center acquisition and development. Their primary currency may be technical real estate, however, fundamentally their infrastructure consists of network traffic, data packets, containers of information being sent and received. In Digital Realty's backyard is the site of operations for the Pacific Bell Telephone Company, as well as berths 67 and 68 in the Port of Oakland, arguably two more traditional forms of transatlantic communication. How is the container form, a pixel of color and logo, implemented as a communications device? Who benefits from the mass proliferation of the container as a spatial product? And how has containerization, a means of transporting these standardized intermodal units, first deployed in Oakland in 1962, been used as a means of transporting information, bodies, and labor? AT&T is Pacific Bell's parent company, in recent years, it has been helping businesses to manage the global transport of containers through their development of Internet of Things technology. In this model, each container has a monitoring device that collects data with sensors and sends them to a web portal. The company's managers can then view the location of containers for owners of the cargo. In this way, the container itself operates as a formal analog to the black box which secretively captures and moves information as both cipher and spatial contagion. Despite these 21st century innovations, this corporation and many others like it still depend upon a system of production that blends elements of feudalism and capitalism from centuries past, the exploitation of cheap prison labor. Since 1993, the company's subcontractors have staffed call centers with inmates who are typically paid less than $2 per day. This practice, a kind of quasi-insourcing, illustrates how the relationship between sovereignty and capital scales to include multiple nodes within the global supply chain. The geometries of the data center, the call center, the factory floor, and the ISO container appear to merge together into an all-consuming enclosure. Ironically, the Internet of Things animus appears in contrast to a more banal reality. The world has too many ships, and not enough stuff to put on them. In September of this year, after finding itself unable to resolve its $5.37 billion debt, South Korean shipping company Hanjin filed for bankruptcy. A confluence of factors had resulted in their hemorrhaging profits. In 2010, Two years after the global financial crisis, the demand for container ships was vastly overestimated. The global GDP, which is interdependent with the profitability of these containers, has seen an annual average growth of 2.9%, down from 4.4% in 2008. Dock workers all over the world, fearing that the company will not be able to compensate them for their work, have refused to admit Hanjin's ships into their ports. As of September 2016, this has left 85 of the 97 container ships in Hanjin's fleet stranded at sea. Moreover, an estimated 25% of the world's container capacity sits empty. Ships are ghosts before they die. In Bangladesh, men are paid starvation wages to dismantle every type of vessel. Their steel, their asbestos, their toxins leach out onto the beaches and into the surrounding waters. This industry employs thousands and supplies Bangladesh with almost all its steel. However, as evidenced by Hanjin's fleet, it is more costly to destroy ships than to keep them idly afloat at sea. While the shipping industry is responsible for transporting nearly 80% of the planet's commodities, the container multiplies even in the landlocked domestic sphere. This built form acts as an emblem of both surplus and scarcity. In Mumbai, developers tout this vernacular architecture as a viable solution to issues of housing for refugees and the poor, while championing liberal projects such as affordable sustainability. 
In the West, they architecturally evolve as signifiers of chic, modernist luxury, particularly for those who desire off-the-grid lifestyles. Yet, one can always identify their coordinates, bound by intersecting lines of manufacturing, capital, and merchandise. There is no place off the grid. Enclosure is merely reimagined as habitat.